good evening, or afternoon, uh, buenos dias, whatever. Um, today I'm going to be reacting to a video from CounterPoints. Uh, generally speaking, um, I enjoy his content. Uh, I generally disagree with him on, on some issues. Um, uh, on, on many issues, I should say. Uh, just kind of on principle, but... He's a thoughtful motherfucker, and it's uh, enjoyable listening to someone, you know, at least uh, go through coherent arguments to some degree, even if he does tend to have an aneurysm uh, when he's discussing some topics uh, on the panel shows that I often see him with. Um, this video just kind of came up uh, in my recommended kind of sidebar shit, so I'm just going to give it the good suck and we're gonna see if we like it, you know what I mean? So let's get into it. Antifa, super soldiers, and damn it, I just busted one of my Warhammer models. Oops, take two. <laughs> so, um, basically, the reason why we're talking about this is because I'm going to be posting a variety of debates. Uh, one, just a you know normal debate conversation that I had with an interesting um, person, um, kind of the routine that you guys are getting with uh, the long form debates and conversations. The other one is going to be the Reverie Roundtable from Monday. Wow, it's only been two days. January 25th, 2021. And one of the feature conversations on there was about Antifa and the nature of Antifa and the optics of Antifa and whether or not it's productive or counterproductive or anything like that. So I've always found these kind of conversations interesting, uh, often because Antifa being as fractured as it is as like an ideology in how it disperses itself and organizes itself throughout the country and throughout the world. Um, they're typically not really concerned uh, with optics. Uh, the actual people who participate in Antifa-oriented protests and stuff like this. So, I'm curious to see where this uh, observational type content or analysis goes. And effectively the prompt was, does Antifa distract from the social movements that they want to propagate, that they want to support? So... That's a good question, and it's a fair question. Um, and I would say by definition, yes, uh, because it is combative and aggressive and um, it's not conciliatory, you know, like uh, uh, people who organize themselves within Antifa are not concerned if you dislike their, you know, positions. They're not concerned... Um, if you disagree with their tactics. Um, typically speaking, Antifa, when they organize themselves, is usually in response to, frankly, like Nazis and, and white supremacists organizing uh, in the affirmative of whatever the fascist uh, oriented or, you know, extreme, like, you know, ethno nationalist type people are, are uh, geared toward or primed toward. Um, and so it's it's usually a direct response to that. And white supremacist systems that exist in the United States take many forms. Uh, some are more subtle, um, like, you know, good cops, for example. You know, like a, a good cop is not necessarily a white supremacist in the individualist sense, but it is a subtle form of, of that kind of power dynamic because it can easily change at the drop of a hat depending on the situation and the system and you know all the structures that are built within it often allow for that good cop to even get away with bad shit um and uh, or even just enforcing things that i would think are immoral like you know laws and uh, convictions that are often associated with like the drug war for example um to like more like obviously that this extends more to like aggressive forms of white supremacist types of movements as well types of uh, movements and thinking and organizing like from the proud boys and and stuff like this and even online like with the the groipers and stuff like that so um yeah i mean uh, by definition it is kind of a distraction you know whenever you're putting yourself up as like a shield and like stating it so um you know whether or not you know my antifa home home people agree with this or not, um, like, you, you're you making yourself the target rather than extending the target to whatever it is you're fighting against. And I, I, at least, if not explicitly, implicitly, they've got to be aware of this, right? I mean, 
if they felt like just pointing out a bad idea or dangerous idea was bad or dangerous uh, did the job, then I imagine they wouldn't be doing the organizing they're doing, right? So the whole point is to be aggressive. Um, and it, and kind of like on principle, let like the, you know, good position. Um, I'm putting it in quotes because some people don't agree that it's good. I agree it's good, but, you know, um, will see the light of day eventually. I mean, after all, like peaceful protests, even back during the civil rights movement, were demonized and extremely unpopular. Um, so, you know, but now we, we don't obviously now like you're. Uh, quite the bastard if you still agree with that like you know the civil rights movement and the protests uh were bad <laughs> so um uh, this is kind of like a time will be on our side approach to aggressive uh counter protesting movements and stuff so they want to help out and the answer is unequivocally yes you will be able to see it in that debate that rather than talking about Black Lives Matter or anti-fascism inside the United States or whether or not Donald Trump is a fascist or uh, whether or not he has fascist-like tendencies, what's the definition of fascism, what do, we, what do we think about American authoritarianism, how do we combat the right? All we did was for fucking two hours we argued the definition of fucking Antifa. That's all we did. Yeah, and uh, I, I didn't see this debate that he's referring to, but um, I, I've, I've seen this um, in my own personal life, like when I've talked about this issue with people that are more right-leaning or even just kind of centrist liberal types, um, where they do get really bogged down by uh, the demonization associated with Antifa. And um, I, I think that's a good thing, though, in the long run, because... Uh, oftentimes people will make excuses for not wanting to kind of deal or grapple with difficult concepts like things like white supremacy in America and like fasc the fascist creep of uh, uh, institutions uh, or, or within institutions in the United States and how often so many people within the populace are okay with that, even outright supporting it, if not like neutrally, neutrally accepting of it or tolerant of it. And so, um, no, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think this is a fair point. And frankly, though, like, you know, even more to the point of that, it, that it's a good a good thing that this is this is the case where, like, uh, it makes it to where when you have this discussion with people about, like, what Antifa is, you're um, going at the root of what their internal biases are, right? Because instead of talking about the issues, they do want to talk about Antifa. And oftentimes, frankly, it's because... Um, you know, this is this is a result of like so much like public discourse that's fueled by the media, fueled by politicians and fueled by Facebook, you know, and like what what shares really well and everything like that. Al algorithmically, what is supported by like what you like and interact with. So all these, you know, uh, uh, data points are just constantly feeding this information into you. Um to the point to where, like, you know, you, you don't want to actually have the discussion about, like, what Antifa is about or what they stand for, um, even even though it's very loose and all issues are localized and, like, there is no, like, Antifa in the sense of, like, a national organization or organizing effort or anything like that. They do organize around some common beliefs. Um, and I think that getting the name out there uh, does... Uh, you know, it, it does at, at the very least uh, give the potential to expose people to these common beliefs. Of course, there's a downside to this because, uh, frankly, this is very similar to the Black Panther approach. And I mean, like when I was growing up in school, I was always told that the Black Panthers were basically the black version of the KKK uh, by teachers, you know, by authority figures. This was just a common belief. I wasn't told about like, their school lunch programs, um, that their the various rehousing efforts. I wasn't uh, told about how like me members were assassinated, you know, like um, Fred Hampton, you know. So I, like I, I didn't learn about any of that stuff until college and afterward, of, of course, because uh, the American education system is uh, bullshit if you're not rich. Um. So, yeah, so, uh, I mean, yeah, th there is a potential downside here, but, like, the alternative is doing nothing, so. Because the left is so fucking slippery when it comes to, you know, their, their defensiveness of Antifa super soldiers that <laughs> it just, like, we, we can't even get past semantics uh, because they're so, they're, they're in such a rush to defend bullshit and um, to optically obfuscate 
what's going on? Uh, I can't speak to specifically what he's referring to as bullshit. I'm sure he'll get into it here. We're only a couple minutes into the video. But, yeah, I mean, people are often quick to to defend um, because uh, the left is often so just fucking poorly misrepresented um, uh, to the point where, like, I can even, like, just discuss, like, basic social democratic reforms with, with a normie. And they immediately start whipping out the C word, you know what I'm saying? And uh, it instead becomes this fucking rhetorical game of, you know, how much of a commie I am. <laughs> Rather than, you know, discussing, like, what, what can help people and what protects the vulnerable. And Antifa in particular is, is specifically interested in protecting the vulnerable, uh, protecting... Um, uh, progressive and uh, leftist protest, counter-protesting people who think that by a show of force they can intimidate uh, by showing those people that you know there is a there is a, an opposing force to them, uh, and also mutual aid, uh, which benefits you know that's a local issue uh, everywhere you know mutual aid is dependent upon uh, the area you live in you know what I mean so. So centrism is fucking exhausting. Like, like literally, I you know I'm gonna post this video and I'm expecting to lose like you know half a dozen subscribers and then gain another half a dozen or a few dozen and it's just gonna go back and forth for fucking ever. But if you came to this channel because you're like, wow, Connor seems really sensible and well thought out, I just want to hear him say my opinions back to me for all of eternity. Uh, fuck you. <laughs> Get off of this channel. I've said it before. I'll say it again. I'll say it in every video until the end of fucking time. I am not here to repeat your opinions back to you. I am here to give you my assessment of reality. And that's the, that's the best that I can do. So to show you that I've thought about some of these things, I can give a whole bunch of concessions to the left. So um, while still thinking that some things are incredibly dumb. So for instance, one of the things that I admitted in that debate and that I'll admit for you right now is that oftentimes conservatives and normies have this conception of violence, right? Extrajudicial, extra state uh, violence where uh, it, it automatically goes into the bad category. If a person punches a person, then it's automatically bad. If a person shoots a person, it's automatically bad. If it's not a cop or a military member, if it's not codified by law, if it's not supported by your institutions, then it's automatically bad. And then it, it goes so far in the normie American conception that we don't even process state violence the same way that we process extrajudicial violence. True. So, for instance, if a cop beats the fuck out of somebody and puts them in cuffs and takes them to jail, even if that beating was unwarranted, we'll say, oh, well, you know, it, it, it's part of the institution. It's part of the right. game. Uh, you know, no institution is perfect, so we make excuses. For See, and I, like I said, I've got my disagreements with this guy. Okay, but you know what? This is, this is a fair... This is a completely fair point, you know, and it's it's nice discussing things with someone that's at least living in the same reality uh, as normal people. State violence. Same thing with drone striking. It's like, oh, well, you know, we bombed, right. a, you know, we bombed a wedding killing like 200 people. In it's turning death into an externality, right? When, when death is institutional, it's this, uh, you know, number on a chart. It's not real people that are being affected. Whereas when we hear about these stories of Antifa violence and the left being violent, um, it's it's a personalized, uh, like anecdotal type of story that is driven into your brain in, a, in, a, in an emotional way to try and tug at you to make you have a visceral reaction against Antifa uh, while at the same time dismissing all of these other forms of violence that are arguably way more violent. Pakistan. It's like, okay, well, there were some terrorists who were obviously at the wedding. We didn't know it was a wedding. A whole bunch of, you know, terrorist cell phones all got together and we fired a missile at it. Oops, killed an entire wedding party and 120 people. How, you know, and that's the, that's literally the American attitude towards it is, whoops. Like, we don't even process that there were probably kids, women, men who were either innocent, innocent yep. or unaware mm -hmm. of their neighbor's participation in jihadism. And oftentimes, too, like these uh, people that we designate as terrorists aren't even terrorists. That's a completely separate uh, issue that's very difficult to unpack. Like the the way that we, uh, the CIA and, and the DOD will often like tag a terrorist is based off of movement patterns. And sometimes that's just not accurate, you know? Um, so, yeah. 
is Islamism, or they were aware but decided to look the other way and just go to a wedding of one of their family members, and as a result, they're now dead. Right. And that's something that we did. Mm -hmm. That's something that our state did on our behalf while fighting jihadist terrorism, and the American attitude is whoops. So, so that's kind of where... You have supports the reason to fucking leave the region, am I right? I have to give this concession to the fact that we will mentally and emotionally excuse state violence almost without a second thought while not even considering the moral implications of interpersonal violence um, because the American conception of interpersonal violence is actually incredibly straightforward and incredibly atomized. It's very individualistic. It all boils down to self-defense. And I think that's incredibly useful and normal, and that's what should be the standard, but I don't mind having a nuanced discussion about the nature of violence or the role of anti-fascist activists or counter-protesters in a civilized or quickly uncivilizing society. So um, just, to, just to give you an example, so Mix Vivian Wolf, uh, somebody who I really did respect during the debate for saying that they had some appreciation or some support for extrajudicial violence as long as it's actually properly targeted and as long as it's in the name of communal defense and like all that kind of shit. I still think this opens up a whole ugly can of worms, but I was happy to hear somebody just say, I understand what I'm doing. I know what I'm doing. I know I am operating outside of the law. I know I am committing violence against people who are not necessarily in a self-defense context. I know that I'm doing that to people I don't like, and I know that I'm doing it exclusively for politics, which is not the, that's not the American political norm. We don't normally mix politics with violence because we, we unless it's state violence, because we don't view mixing those two as long-term stable. Okay, so I'm curious as to what he means by the American norm. Because, I mean, it's definitely been the norm that we mix politics and violence. I mean, how. When did the Whiskey Rebellion happen? Just out of curiosity here. Whiskey Rebellion. Yeah, 1791 to 1794. So. Yeah. And and then of course like how many slave rebellions were there? Slave rebellions, U.S. Yeah. I mean the fact that there were so many, we have a top five from PBS. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Um, I'm uh, I I'm not I'm not really agreeing with this point unless unless he's meaning something else because i mean if we're talking about it about how we discuss politics right where we like we like to disassociate politics from violence then that's probably fair because the way the media will discuss politics is often esoteric uh it's you it, like it's usually like policy oriented uh from the left or the left center left center centrist types like on msnbc and stuff um to like uh, social issue oriented uh, regarding like religious issues like abortion and stuff like that or guns um, you know so it turns it into like you know a debate you would have in debate class but all politics is violence right like when we put forward the drug reforms that we did through the 70s all the way into the 90s um, yeah it's just policy right but when you're increasing the amount of people being incarcerated Right. Like you're there is a strong correlation between the drug war and gun violence. Um, like there's even like the I think a fair right wing libertarian argument of the drug war is what fuels a lot of the profitability for a lot of these uh, drug cartels and such, because you're giving the criminal um, the monopoly on the distribution of a product that people want, which is drugs. And so, um, yeah, I mean, like, they're, they're, these are extremely complex sociopolitical, socioeconomic related issues, uh, but it's all stemming from politics, right? And to, to, to try and create a distinction between politics and violence is an error. So I wonder if that's the point he's making. And, but because it, it's true that we do do that in America to where we like to disassociate them but it's not true that it's a norm 
Because we've always been violent with our politics outright. We had a fucking civil war in this country. Uh, that's still our deadliest war to date. Um, in terms of, like, you know, killed in action, you know. Obviously, this is not con considering, like, the genocide against the native uh, people and everything like this. But, um, but yeah, so. So, it's not, like, unless you want to go back into the 19th century or the 1940s. Or the 1960s unless it's like a gang or a racist organization or a terrorist organization that then incurs the wrath of the federal government or the state government or law enforcement then we don't really have that normalization of gang violence we don't have brown shirts and well, okay hang on antifa's not gang violence though red shirts running through the street beating the fuck out of each other in the name of politics wasn't really normal until the past five years i mean that's still not normal really i mean even like the proud boys are a fucking fringe operation and antifa generally speaking their organizing is around mutual aid um so yeah and to pretend that it was I, one i would like to see historical examples and then two i would like to debate and talk more about the role of the state in support of or in the prosecution of those organizations that try to normalize political violence in America. Now, Europe could be completely different. Jesus Christ. Like, look at European history. It's fucking wild. Like, I know that everybody thinks they're a bunch of, like, Disneyland fucking pussies or whatever, but Europe has a... Let's just say that Europe has a history of normalizing political violence. So, the... For sure. This is <laughs> And in America, we carry on the tradition. I think our forefathers would be proud. One of the things that I wanted to point out is, as an American, we, we externalize violence to the state. So we say, hey, military, go kill jihadist terrorists and anybody who wants to beef with the United States of America. Okay. We say, hey, cops, if somebody's doing something bad and they don't want to go to jail with you or go to court, then you can beat the fuck out of them. And then we externalize violence that way. Then the other thing that we do is we have this baked-in culture of self-defense. It's rooted in the colonization of the United States of America with the Wild West. It's rooted in with the uh, militias of the early revolutionary days. It's rooted in a lot of our culture, a lot of our territory being settled in the past 200 years. And what that effectively does is it says, like, hey, you can't go around killing random people, but if somebody tries to kill you, a Native American, a rebelling slave, a, uh, you know, Ku Klux Klan member, a, a uh, what, what is it, um, the Day Knights, something like that? There, there was, like, this gang of Mormons in, like, Nevada and Utah who were, like, running around, like, randomly killing uh, caravans of people heading out to California and then kidnapping their women and then marrying them. And, you know, we, we literally had, like, a, a rape, religious, polygamous, murderous cult in Utah and Nevada for a while. So, effectively, what we did is we said, okay, the state can't be there all the time. Cops can't be there all the time. The military can't be there all the time. So, if somebody tries to kill you, you can kill them. That's the American mentality. It, it, it's literally as simple as that. It's not we're evolved creatures and we've evolved past violence. It's not this European thing where, like, war or violence is... I mean, this is not necessarily wrong, but there is a, an inherent double standard here. Um, because, obviously, like, people who are part of marginalized communities, like former slaves back in those days, uh, black people today even, like, they don't have that same benefit of doubt given to them by the state. Because at the end of the day, in modern America, if there's a situation to where you do have to take someone else's life f for reasons of self-defense, um, a white person... A white man is going to be given a lot more leniency um, in their sentencing if they are sentenced. Like, if it's found to be, like, you know, they're more likely to be let off. They're more likely to be given, like, a lighter sentence than someone who is a person of color. Um, so, I okay. So, but, but also, to this point, it's not necessarily going against the idea of Antifa. Like, I still disagree with the idea that Antifa is a roaming gang, because that's kind of the implication that was being said earlier. Um, and, like, even, like, so the, like, Proud Boys and shit aren't, like, really arrested uh, really ever for the shit that they do during their protests. So, um, yeah, I want to see where he's going with this. 
you know, it shouldn't even be a human, uh, it shouldn't even be a human conception anymore. No, like, Americans are very comfortable with uh, killing in the name of self-defense. We're just like, hey, they try to kill you, you kill them, doesn't matter. Do it. Go for it. I mean, I, uh, I just don't agree with this. Um, I mean, there are definitely people that are okay with it. Uh, I, I would say it's more of like a split issue, personally. Like, like it's just kind of like go to go to Florida or go to go to Texas and talk to them about um, you know self defense cases. And you'll- yeah, but even in the yeah, I don't know. You can pick the two fucking batshit examples of America, which is literally Texas and Florida, which both of those states are barely America. They're their own nations in so many ways. Um, but I mean, you go really anywhere else in the country and, and, you know, like there'll definitely be the, the mentality of like, Oh, I hope some motherfucker tries to take some shit from me. But at the end of the day, you know, um, killing someone's killing someone, you know, that's not, it's not a small thing. Um, and even people who are really gung ho on that should understand that. Because the people who are gung-ho in that shit, they have veterans in their family, right? They've seen the look on someone, uh, the look on their face, like, before they went off to war and after they came home. And how broken that person is. So, you know, I I agree with him in a sense, for sure. Um, But I feel like it's a little bit more complicated than this. They'll be like, God damn right. <laughs> like they, they literally won't care. And effectively what we've done there is we've, we've atomized, along with American individualism, the right to self-defense. And so that's where we feel like if the government fails in protecting human beings, if the, if the police fail in protecting human beings, then you still have yourself. And you can actually see this with like right-wing support of uh, minority self-defense groups. Now, the, so- Except for the Black Panthers. <laughs> I'll, I'll give you two good examples and then maybe one not so good example. Roof Koreans. The right wing loves roof Koreans. During the 1992 riots and yeah. during other riots, uh, Korean folks who. Immig- but the roof Koreans are going against who? What was the primary uh, group of people that were in the in the in the riots? Right, it was black people. Right, so like when when you're going against black people, it's easy to find allies. A lot of conservatives, frankly, are that simple. Integrated here in order to own their own businesses. They got under their rooftops. They exercised their Second Amendment rights. When somebody tried to raid or burn their store, they shot them. That's awesome. Americans love that shit. Koreans are honorary, <coughs> not even honorary. <coughs> and by the way, I know like a lot of lefties for some reason um, are against this kind of stuff because they, they think of human life as more valuable than property. But uh, if, if, my, if my property... My home, like if if you're going to break into my home or break into the business that I personally own, like my own shop that provides for me and my family and you're going to try and take from me, I'm sorry, dude, but you're jeopardizing my life by doing that. (laughs) And in return, your life is now in jeopardy. I'm sorry. It's not to say that property and objects and things are more valuable than a human life, but property and objects and things, and we're talking about just personal property. Like that's time out of my life that I dedicated toward those things. And you don't get to take that away just because you're in the middle of some riot or something like that, especially because like the, the rooftop Koreans he's referring to, they didn't, they're not the, re- they, they didn't beat anyone's ass as a police officer right like it's not their fault so yeah i mean yeah so americans they're just americans <laughs> somebody tries to damage your shit somebody tries to kill you you kill them you're an american <laughs> same thing uh with the with this guy would be a great drinking partner the recent BLM riots, uh, there there were Sikh store owners, you know, like like obviously with you know Muslims, there's a little bit of a there's a little bit of a edgy edgy history when it comes to uh, Muslims armed with assault rifles, but when it comes to Sikhs who are defending their gas stations or their stores or whatever, yeah, fucking do it, dude, do it, like like guard your store, guard your income, guard your business. You immigrated here for a reason to make money for you and your family. You want a higher quality of life. Somebody threatens that, shoot them. Like that's the. 
Now, I don't agree with the callousness of this, of course, because, like I said, killing someone is killing someone, you know? Like, it's not a flippant action. Um, it's a serious thing, you know? But, uh, like, like I said, in principle, I don't necessarily disagree. I mean, if you're gonna, if, if you're gonna fuck with my livelihood, like, yeah, I'm gonna do what I can to non-violently, you know, diffuse the situation as much as possible, but... I mean, if you're going to persist and then, like, threaten my life, too, I mean, I'm sorry. All bets are off. You're an American. Like, like that's and I feel like people who disagree with this, by the way, have lived very sheltered lives. You know, like, <laughs> I've been around some fucked up people, my, my, my you know, like, eh, like, it's just when you're in kind of those situations, you know, it's, it's, uh. It's kind of easy to understand, like, where he is coming from on this. Where Connor's coming from. So. That's what it is. So. Did he say his name was Connor? Fuck, I don't remember now. I think he did. So, I already feel the keyboards getting clickety-clacked in the fucking background. Um, Black Panthers. What about Black Panthers? Oh, you fucking got me, dude. Yeah, I literally brought up the Black Panthers. Yeah, okay. Go on. Ronald Reagan passed an assault weapons ban, or tried to pass an assault weapons ban after the Black Panthers protested at the Capitol. That's right. And, uh, you know, Black Panthers, uh, you know, were, were civilian defense groups for the black community. That's right. In response to racist cops. And uh, as a result, they were completely demonized and helped pass gun control in California. That's okay, right. Fine. But, uh, fine. Fine. There, there's a there's a sordid and messy and dark history when it comes to black civil defense groups. But can we also concede that some of these black civil defense groups like just randomly killed cops and committed terrorist actions. Like, like seriously. I mean, no, I, I, I don't concede that. No, I, I would need to see specifically what he's talking about. We, we can talk about justification or morality or anything like that. I'm not trying to say, I'm not trying to judge like an individual moral action. Although I do think shooting cops is wrong. Um, but I mean, shooting anyone is wrong implicitly, unless you're defending your own life. But is it true that some like not defending a business? not defending their personal property that random members of the black panthers like just executed cops uh i i i i am not familiar with this personally no um black panther is executing police yeah fred hampton comes up yeah that's right <laughs> I mean, the whole thing with COINTELPRO was it was literally, like, trying to kill Black Panther leaders. I mean, I would have to look into this more, but, like, I, I, have, not, I have not heard of extrajudicial cops being, like... In the early hours of February 10th, 1971, police surrounded a property in High Point, North Carolina, where members of the Black Panther Party lived and worked. In the ensuing shootout, a Panther and a police officer were both wounded. The incident did not receive much national attention at the time. Armed conflict of this type was relatively common during the late 1960s and early 1970s. But 50 years on, as the U.S. reckons with a year that saw militarized police confront Black Lives Matter protests and fail to prevent an attack on the U.S. Capitol, I believe the circumstances of this shootout are relevant today. As a historian who has interviewed participants in the confrontation for our coming book, I see the raid in the context of a then-emergent strategy of urban policing in the U.S., shaped by the racial and political clashes of the 1960s and forged through a growing partnership between local and federal law enforcement. That strategy of criminalizing black political activism at a time when white reactionary protesters were accommodated has defined police responses to Americans' activism Americans's, and political violence over the past half-century. Aggressive approach. The approach of law enforcement on the bitterly cold morning of February 10, 1971 was aggressive and combative. Brad Lilly, the 19-year-old leader of the High Point branch of the Black Panthers, woke at 5 a.m. to discover about 30 police officers and sheriff's deputies surrounding the rented house he shared with three other teenage members of the organization. The police were seeking to evict the Panthers. Despite the fact that Lilly and other members were paying rent on time, High Point police were looking to force them out in line with the national strategy of pushing Black Panthers out of communities because of their political 
political activities. So I imagine this goes into D. I don't want to read the whole article here, but like whenever I try and look up the examples that he's talking about, and this is not the first time I've tried doing this because I've had this discussion before. Like th- these are the stories I find, right? We talk, we like they, we we bring up how Fred Hampton was murdered, like Mumia Abdul Jamal uh, Jabbar was is fucking uh, Jamal is fucking like wrongfully convicted. Like I'm sorry, I just and um yeah. And so, like, I'm sorry. Like, I'm just, I, I have a hard time conceding this point without, like, some kind of an example. Because um, every time, and this is a part of my own learning that I've had to do regarding the Black Panthers and and uh, the culture of America, you know, in response to them, was, frankly, unlearning bullshit. So, no, I don't concede this point. Defending their personal property that random members of the Black Panthers like just executed cops. Nope. It's true. It happened. So, you know. Whatever. <laughs> like moving on. We won't make it we won't make any moral judgments today, but let's just make some descriptive claims. Okay? So and like again, even if this is true Okay, even if this is true, I still don't agree with the premise he's laying out here. Cause first of all, when you have like large organized movements or um, ideologies that people organize around, you can't control everyone within the ideology, right? Or within the organization, right? Like, you, you, you just... So, even by his own definition of, hey, you know, there were people who did do these things and it was not okay, it was wrong and immoral and it murdered people that didn't deserve to be murdered. That's not... A refutation of like the point, which is that conservatives demonize minorities, uh, arming themselves and defending their communities against white supremacist power structures. Right? It's not a refutation of that point. Even though he again he doesn't have an example here. So so this is where the entire conversation really gets frustrating, right? Because I feel like the left effectively makes a they, they play this, like, bullshit semantic game. And, like, I get it. Like, everybody on the left has an IQ over 100. You're smarter than conservatives. I Damn straight, and our dicks are bigger, too. Like, I fucking get it. Like, like Jesus Christ. Like, like, like t- take a word that nearly everybody in American parlance completely understands. Like, racism. Like, like bigotry over somebody's race. Like, like that's... Very simple definition. We've understood it for a really long time. Oh, well, turns out that racism is now prejudice plus power. So you're wrong, honky. Change. Okay, and I this is a this is a fair point. And frankly, the left shoots itself in the foot when it when it like in because my idea of political action is, and like you know discussion is meeting people where they're at. And oftentimes that does involve being combative, like with groups like Antifa, where like. I don't need I don't have time to wait on you to understand that black lives matter, right? But at the same time, like when you're having a, a prejudice plus power conversation, the the layman is just going to interpret that as, well, what fucking power do I have? You know, because the average white person benefits from white privilege, but even discussing white privilege, like what that means because of how loaded the terminology is. It makes it come off uh, to to this person, you know. Not, I'm not saying this is what I believe, but to this person that you're saying this to, to them, it's like, well, I don't have privileges, right? Like, I'm fucking living, you know, paycheck to paycheck. I have debts, you know what I mean? Like, I have medical debts, you know. I have medical issues, you know. Like, I suffer from the economic system, uh, like you do. Um, so I I think I do personally agree here with where rhetorically yeah it's not it's not good rhetoric to try and like fucking be the the smarty pants in the classroom when people don't even understand like the 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 normie point they don't understand the normie point about you know white supremacist power structures institutional racism systemic racism and like how that affects white people Right. Like this is the same argument that oftentimes, you know, when you're talking about like patriarchal, uh, patriarchal, patriarchal, whatever, patriarchy. And you're talking about like, you know, the effects of that on society, how it does negatively affect men. 
You know, a, a great example of this is how oftentimes men are not encouraged to be emotionally vulnerable, especially with other men. Right? That's a negative outcome for you as a man. That's a negative outcome. Right? But when you try and characterize it in this, in this jargon, uh, people can't relate to that. And you know, and you know what? You're not gonna win every time. Even if you do try and meet them where they're at, they're gonna call you slurs, or they're gonna be rude to you. They're gonna dismiss your points, call you stupid, or call you a snowflake, or a cuck, or whatever. You're not gonna win every single time. But the point is, is you still have to fucking meet them where they're at. You're not going to just win them over with your fucking super smarty pants jargon and words. So no, this is this is a point that I uh, that I I agree with. Your definition, like like. Okay, I'll update my definition for the sake of conversation, but if you keep moving the ball, I'm going to get pissed off. And then for um, sure. same thing with violence. Oh, well, you know, apparently, you know, throwing Molotov cocktails into unoccupied buildings isn't violence. I assume that it was violence. Uh, let's go ahead and Google the definition of violence so we can see if uh, Google or, uh, you know, anybody, like, uh, believes that, like, violence or, or that uh, destructive actions towards a building can be violence. Let's look up violence. Um, uh, behavior involving physical force intended to hurt, damage, or kill someone or something. Sounds to me like something could be a building and physical force intended to hurt or damage. It sounds like a Molotov cocktail. Uh, it could be that. The unlo let, Let's read another couple of definitions. The unlawful exercise of physical force or intimidation by the exhibi exhibition of such force. Why do you change the definition? Lefties, please, why? Explain it to me. Is it so you could win, like, dumbass fucking semantic arguments on Twitter? Because that's what it feels like. It and also, too, like, if you do destroy property, um, I, I do agree with a concept of structural violence. I wonder if there's going to be a definition here. Because structural violence will, yeah, systematic ways in which social structures harm or otherwise disadvantage individuals. You can kind of reduce this um, where the structural violence that, like, someone uh, feels from, like, wage labor, for example, uh, to where, like, you being uh, living on, like, a subsistence wage makes it to where you can't pay for medical care, which makes it to where you die sooner, that I would consider that a form of violence to where the, essentially, you know, the reductive argument, but I would say accurate argument, uh, we can, you know, it, it's something we can expand on if, like, anyone were to disagree with me vehemently on this, is that, like, poverty is violence by definition because you're being forced to live in conditions that make it easier for you to die. <laughs> uh, I would say that's violence. Um, in a society to where your income defines your livelihood, destroying someone's property is some is a form of violence. So, um, frankly, you know the petite bourgeois, as my Marxist buddies like to say, right? The small business owner, the manager, they're really not the enemy here. They don't define the power structures, right? They just operate within them. It doesn't feel like changing violence to only involve like physical force against a person. Oh yeah, and so like being ignorant of this and like actively trying to deny this to like seem morally pure is a problem on the left. And you especially see this on fucking Twitter, man. Don't get me wrong, I like Twitter, but I fucking hate it at the same time. I don't know how I don't know how to explain it. I like it, but I really don't like it does anything productive in the in the political parlance except for like playing a fucking big dumb game of fucking uh goalpost moving so uh, i'm gonna go ahead and say you know fuck you on that one um <laughs> oh, oh and then terrorism let's see if there's like a, a, a demon mama okay i'm happy demon mama and i made up or like at least we had like a play conversation or whatever but her whole like terrorism thing was like one it triggered the fuck out of me and then two it just didn't seem smart the unlawful use of violence so unlawful being a part of the definition so if a state lawfully ex executes violence against certain people and it does so lawfully, then it wouldn't be in this definition. The unlawful use of violence and intimidation, especially against civilians in the pursuit of political aims. And then on top of that, like drone strikes in military force is generally speaking aimed at combatants. It's not aimed at civilians intentionally. That's the moral difference between fucking terrorism. Uh, okay, so I know that you're a veteran, so I know that like I, I've had these discussions with veterans before, and it's really hard to get through to them, but... <sighs> the, 
the political aim here would be to further the progress of U.S. Uh, influence and success within the region. Uh, I highly, like with the Iraq War, I highly, 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 highly recommend a podcast uh, called Blowback. Uh, if you've not watched it or listened to it, uh, please do. It's on Spotify. It is free. Um, it goes over our relationship with Saddam and uh, the nation of Iraq uh, from before uh, the Soviet Union collapsed uh, to all, all the way up until like the present day. And so it, it covers multiple presidential administrations and our failure in the region um, and uh, how basically like our interaction with that region is for purely political means and we when we commit violence in the furtherance of those political means that is by definition terrorism you know so if we're trying to in if we're trying to influence our geopolitical power within the area um that's terrorism <laughs> you know when, when you're when you're drone striking enemy combatants you know you're you're just basically saying oh it's not terrorism because it's war right but that's that's politics, baby. <laughs> war is politics. By definition, war is terrorism. Terrorism in our in our mind, when we think of terrorism, we think of 9-11, right? Well, that is terrorism. No doubt. No doubt. Um, they were responding to a different set of of terrorist acts that led to half a million dead Iraqi kids from direct U.S. involvement in the Middle East. You know, one of the main reasons why I don't like truthers is, I mean, of course, because they're fucking stupid as shit uh, and they don't understand anything. Um, but uh, whenever you try and, and uh, obf obfuscate, like, what, why 9-11 happened... You're ignoring what the people who planned and went through with believed and why they literally sacrificed themselves to go against the big bad, which is America. And that is because of our terrorism in the Middle East. Straight up. We want oil. We want geopolitical influence. We want to put pressure on people that we're competing with, namely Russia and China and Iran, which is kind of an extension of the Russian uh, conflict in a lot of ways. And so we commit heinous acts of violence to justify it. And we just cloak it in American nationalism and the idea that we're coming to bring democracy and peace and anyone that we kill as an enemy combatant uh, when if you go over a lot of the justifications for so many battles and uh, strikes and uh, invasions in the region, they they it's not like someone it's not like a civil war or someone is attacking us and we're trying to take out their arms, um, you know, to, to for self preservation, right? It's not a war of self preservation. Uh, which those wars are definitely like not as terrorist, you know, terroristic uh, by definition, because, you know, if you're going to die and the only option is to fight and to kill in order to not die, then I would not say that's terrorism. But war, when you're basically committing the most extreme political act uh, in the furtherance of your political influence, I mean, this is not a semantic game here. That is fucking terrorism. You can't, like, if you, seriously, like, if you think, and, and the, it's so triggering that I have to repeat myself, like, four times. If you think that there is not a moral difference between cops who are bound by, like, the use of force, um, legislated by the state, trained for weeks at a time, um, who are, you know, maybe not as accountable as you want them to be, but are still accountable to their chain of command and still accountable to some level of, like, civil lawsuit and criminal prosecution, um, them throwing tear gas into a crowd versus a dude loading up an 18-wheeler with cinder blocks 
and then driving through said crowd, killing hundreds of people, including like school age children. Like if you can't morally and mentally differentiate that, you are so fucking lost that like I don't even know what to do for you. Like I, I feel like I should be getting you like fucking crayons and a flashlight and like a bubble suit. Because you're so fucking stupid, I don't even know how you draw like air into your lungs consistently in order to continue living. So like, I like if anybody does that in my presence ever again, like I'm 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 not gonna I'm not gonna treat it. I, I've made. This but, but terrorism isn't just the former. Like if so, like I don't know. I feel like this is a very uncharitable interpretation of terrorism. You're you are adjusting terrorism as a concept to fit your narrative. Um, which is what you're criticizing. Like, you're criticizing that action. I'm saying that that is terrorism as well as the other things are terrorism, right? Just by the definition of the word, which is acts of uh, basically you know, violence to serve a political means. Mistake. Which, I don't even... What, that situation where he drove through the crowd, was that even, like, politically oriented? I don't know. Of treating we'll just say it was when they're making arguments as if they're actually making because the uh, I don't remember the details making. and I'm not going to do that anymore if you say some like wildly stupid shit any anymore I'm not going to debate you like you're making a good point I'm literally just going to point out how fucking dumb your point is and I'm going to beat you to death with it until you stop using that point okay, okay. <laughs> so you guys have that to look forward to especially since I'm starting to record my conversations Cool. Right. By the way, this video has not really been about Antifa at all. <laughs> I just want to, like, we're, we're kind of, we're nearing the last portion of it here. We've not really touched on Antifa. I'm just saying. So, uh, Antifa conversations often devolve into a conversation about anti-fascism as an ideology versus the individual actions of Black Bloc. And I swear to God, if you, fu if you do what I think you're going to do in my comments, you don't even have to unsubscribe. I'll just ban you. I'll just ban you from the channel. I don't care. So let's talk about anti-fascism as an ideology. The stance that fascism, ethno-corporatism and authoritarianism, or ultra-nationalism and authoritarianism are bad. I'm an anti-fascist, okay? I, I, I do not believe that fascism is a viable political movement. I think it brings us into some very toxic historical narratives. I think it's bad for people in general. I think when people join fascist movements, they ultimately doom their own country to a large amount of interpersonal and political strife and destruction. Um, I am not interested in it as an ideology. I don't want to see it promulgated. I don't want to see it succeed. And I am interested in combating it rhetorically, politically, and if needs be violently through military force law enforcement action. Okay? I'm an anti-fascist. But when we use the word Antifa, we are not talking about people who vaguely subscribe to the concept of anti-fascism, which again, Fascism, for those of you who don't know, is ethno-corporatism slash ultranationalism, depending on which one you want to pick, and authoritarianism. That's what it is. Those two blended together. We can talk about it another day. I have an excellent video talking about fascism. So, we're not talking about the ideology. We're talking about college-age dickheads showing up head to toe in black and then beating the fuck out of people. Okay? That is just not true. No. And oftentimes beating the fuck out of people who aren't ready for a fight. Whenever you also not true. You see an Antifa fight compilation, literally look at the people that they're fighting. See, already right there. Fucking looking up at Antifa fight compilations. Like, why not actually interact with someone who actually interacts with Antifa? Like, I know people in Antifa. 99% of the work people do in Antifa is mutual aid. And when they're setting up counter protests, they're peaceful. They're only there as a show of force against people who are violent. People like the Proud Boys, which was just added to the fucking Canadian terrorist watch list, by the way. And ask yourself this question. Are these hardened, violent criminals that are getting the shit kicked out of them? Or are a bunch of LARPy college kids beating the fuck out of normies? Because that's what it looks like. It looks like Black Block is beating the fuck out of North. Who gives a fuck what it looks like? I'm sorry. Like, at this point, like, it's kind of buying into that narrative where, like, where what I was saying earlier, where it's like, Antifa is perceived as aggressive. Good. Good. This is, of course, ignoring all of the fucking... The, the reason why Antifa shows up, by the way, is because of how violent... 
uh, ethno-nationalist people like the Proud Boys are when they show up and do their little protests. This is completely ignoring that. And then, inversely, if a militia group or if the Proud Boys show up, what, generally speaking, happens? The right wing kicks the shit out of the left wing. That's what normally happens, because LARPy college students are not actually ready for a fair fist fight. So, so that's kind of like... Three. But hang on, they only show up against Proud Boys and stuff like that. Like, they, they don't just show up at random fucking... They don't, they don't... Antifa doesn't do a protest on their own. They show up in response to an existing organiza- organized effort from the right. Wild to me that we have to spend half hour to an hour to two hours arguing about whether or not we're talking about the ideology or whether or not we're talking about LARPy fucking college kids showing up to beat the fuck out of normies at political protests because they think that it's good. You see, I, I'm kind of regretting saying that we live in the same reality here because this is just Republican propaganda. This is just not true. Great. You punch Richard Spencer. Awesome. Cool. You, you got one Nazi. How many- I mean, that is cool, though. I, he's saying it kind of flippantly, but it's 100% cool. Always uh, punch Richard Spencer in a video game. How many fucking normies have you beaten the fuck out of? Probably a lot. Yeah, probably he's doing a lot of heavy lifting there, bud. All right, so let's talk about counter-protesting really quickly. So I don't give a fuck about counter-protesting. It's awesome. Go. I, I think I think in the wake of Charlottesville, there was like um, there was like a free speech event. It wasn't even like a white nationalist event. It was like a free speech event, and I think like 300 fucking people showed up to the protest, and like 30,000, like almost like uh, you know a third of downtown Boston showed up to counter protest. What did you say with that counter protest? And I think that weekend went off without violence too. What did you say with that counter protest? You said you're a bunch of dumb fucks. It, like like okay, so I love freedom of speech, so I'm not I'm not knocking freedom of speech for the people who actually believe in freedom of speech. But let's say that they, every single person who is going to the free speech event is actually a crypto crypto fascist. What did 30,000 people showing up to a protest of 300 say? It said, we don't believe in fascism. We will organize and show up to combat you. There are infinitely more of us than there are of you. That's a powerful message. And you don't need to beat the fuck out of anybody in order to do it. Just beating the fuck out of people. This is literally what I think. I, I just think beating people up is fun. I think that's why Black Bloc does what they do. But it's dog shit optics. It, it, it's, it, it's as if a dog... Yeah, but the counter-protest is not for the optics. The counter-protest is against the people who are initiating the aggressive, like, ethno-nationalist bullshit. You're trying to send a message to the Proud Boys and to their ilk that you are not welcome and we will fight you. It's a little bit different, right? Like, the normie is going to equivocate between the two. They're going to say, oh, hey, this person supports mutual aid and rights for marginalized people, and they they support, you know, being anti-racist, and these guys want to create a white European descent ethnostate and genocide anyone that doesn't want to leave it. You know, it's just hard to tell the difference. So normies are just not emotionally invested enough in either, uh, either end of the spectrum and not affected negatively enough by either end of the spectrum to have any strong opinions on it who gives a fuck what they think who gives a fuck how they see it who gives a fuck who gives a fuck i still to this day talk with people who just don't even understand how the government works but they think they know everything about politics I had to explain to someone that thinks of themselves as like an economics strong person, like they understand economics well, that like inflation won't happen if you raise the minimum wage because inflation is related to the value of a currency. It doesn't just mean prices go up because I raise prices. That's not what inflation is. So these are people that just think they know things and they fucking don't. So who gives a fuck what their opinion is? I'm sorry. Like, don't get me wrong. Like, if I'm trying to convince them on an issue, I care about convincing them. But at the end of the day, when we're talking about things that are matters of life and death, things that the Proud Boys err on the side of death of, 
being aggressive against that aggressive force matters more than how people who are not participating and people who do not get negatively or positively affected by the situation think. Period. Uh, ate his shit. Like, like he shit. Then he ate it. Then he vomited it. And then he ate it again. And then he shit it again. And that's the level of optics that Black Bloc brings to the table for lefty movements. And even the fact that they would deny that it was, like, lefty. Like, get the fuck out of here. Like, like oh, my God. Anyways, so j just watch the debate. Watch the Prime Kai debate. You'll see exactly what I'm talking about. <clears throat> no, I, I mean, I'm of the opinion of, of owning this. Like, I, I just don't give a shit about the optics. Um, so, Because in that situation, I'm not trying to convince the normie. I'm trying to be aggressive against the aggressor. Anyway, let's try to wrap it up. So, so I participated in a documentary with Lauren Southern. It was largely about law enforcement. It's called Crossfire. It's on our website. If you don't want to fucking watch it, go fucking bitch shoot or torrent it or some shit. Um, if you if you don't want to support her financially, but you still want to see it, and I actually like the first hour and eight minutes. It's it's about cops. It's about corruption. It's about reform. It's about uh, you know Breonna Taylor. It's about a whole bunch of shit. But then like the middle forty five minutes is basically like BLM bad, Antifa bad, uh, thirteen fifty. Okay, and What's so obnoxious about it is that I, I got to see the the editing cuts in the I, I'm not I'm not describing this to Lauren because there were other people involved in the project, but effectively like if you would have watched the original edit, the original edit was like Antifa are com internationally trained communist fucking super soldiers who are starting the communist revolution inside America. Seriously. And <laughs> while that might not be the belief of every mainstream conservative, jump on conservative Twitter. Jump on conservative fucking talk show hosts. Jump on conservative fucking anything. And, and the fact that, like, the fact that lefties don't think that they have to share a country with conservatives. It's like, what are you going to do? You're going to brainwash them all? You're actually going to take them to fucking gulags? You're going to fucking... I don't think lefties think this. This is a straw man. You're going to re-educate all their asses? Are you going to kill them? Like, what are you going to do? These the 70 million people, you're going to kill them all? You're going to fucking, you're going to re-educate them all? Get the fuck out of here. Like, stop larping. I do agree that, like, tactically speaking, online lefties are very bad at communicating with this segment of the population. They think that they don't have to do that. Um, but I, I think this is a hyperbolic representation of how they feel. You have to deal with these people. And guess what the best way to deal with them is? Talking to them, explaining your ideology, not doing intellectual fucking goalposting, not True. playing obfuscation games with fucking definitions, yeah. not pretending that like a college degree made you fucking king of the universe. Literally take your fucking good ideas yeah. and communicate it to your fellow fucking Americans. And on top of that, realize that they're your fellow fucking Americans, you goddamn dipshits. Ugh, it's frustrating. It, it, like as somebody who literally believes that like temperamentally conservative people are necessary for the functioning of a healthy society and temperamentally liberal and progressive people are necessary for the healthy functioning of a society. Do you have any idea how wildly frustrating this entire political conversation is? Like, I love it because it gives me an opportunity to do what I do. But still, like, dude, come on. Get the fuck out of here. You guys are wild. All right. So, and then finally, like, the whole, like, Antifa is an ideology, not an organization. Listen, if I text fucking three of my friends and I say, hey, let's go to the movies after COVID, we're going to be in a group. If we have a group chat, we're going to be in a group. And if we organize the logistics of going to the movies, we're going to be known as a group. So this whole Antifa is an ideology, not an organization thing. I mean, Jesus Christ, you have more organization than me and my four dickhead friends going to the fucking movie theater. Let's be real. Uh, this is a stupid point. The, the, the point is, though, there's no national organizing, right? Like... Like Justice Democrats, that's an organization, right? Like they, that there's a, there's a leader of the organization. They have secretaries. They have organizing efforts through all the states, and they procure candidates and they vet people and all this stuff. Antifa is literally. Do you agree with these set of principles? Hey, we're gonna organize on Facebook locally against specific issues. You know, like Antifa in Seattle is gonna be different from Antifa in Orlando. Um, and, and basically, like, you could call me and my friends a group. So let's stop the bullshit fucking semantic games. It's not semantics, though. It's, it's, it's a, there's a logistical difference between a national organization versus, like, an ideology that captivates people nationally that they locally organize around. Really exhausting. I'm tired of it. Um, and I'm not going to tolerate it anymore. And I'm going to fucking meme on it, and I'm going to dunk on it, and I'm going to make you look fucking stupid. Because it is stupid.
Anyways. All right, so even if you didn't like that, bye. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, in general, um, the video wasn't really like a good uh, like debunk of Antifa uh, at all. Yeah. I mean, like, Antifa is a completely valid political project, especially as we have the rise of ethno-nationalism and fascism within the United States and the Western world writ large. Um, although there are some completely fair points being made when it comes to communicating with the right and centrists and normies, uh, as it's stated here, to get, like, a fucking good idea of, like, like how to combat this problem, this cancer on democracy. Uh, so, I mean, that's a fair criticism, and oftentimes, especially on the left, online, more so than in real life, because in real life is a completely different animal, and, you know, people are much more, um, empathetic, and it's easy to conversate, and stuff like that. Oh, but online, it's just, it's about clout chasing, so, yeah, but, yeah, um, a couple of things here and there that I, I really think he fucked up on, um, like, especially the whole missing of the Black Panthers point. Like, not not, not great. Um, there's no false equivalence here when it comes to that kind of issue. But, anyways, uh, if you made it to the end, uh, which based off my analytics is probably, like, one person. Hey, thanks for sticking around. Be sure to subscribe. Be sure to send some love with a like or a dislike. And leave a comment if you have something to say. And, of course, um, I hope you have yourself a fucking awesome rest of your day or night.